Good morning. If everyone can get their seats, we're going to start our presentations this morning. And uh, I hope you guys have been having a great conference. My name is Shoji Sataki, and um, I am uh, a board member and the on site coordinator for the Pittsburgh conference that will be happening next year. I just want to let you know this is the second year of a three year project to have Fab Lab at Enseca. And, then, and um, we're live streaming this right now. All of our lectures and demonstrations are being live streamed in this room through the 92nd Street Y portal. So you guys are being watched globally, right? The people from around the world. And, um, and we have been getting a lot of good feedback and, and people have been tuning in from all parts of the world. And um, I, we really want your feedback. So if you can go to the Enseca app after these lectures, after the conference, let us know because we want to make this program even better for our third and final year. In fact, it might not even be the third and final year if you guys really like it and we can continue on. And then, and, um, and one of my, and we do, uh, where I teach at West Virginia University, we actually have a, a 3D printing program. And uh, Kelly O'Brien, who talked yesterday, is one of our coordinators for that. And so we, you know, w this is another tool that we believe is just like the potter's wheel that's never going away. It's just going to get better. And it's going to allow us to become better artists and think about new ways of making art. And so uh, we want your help. And if you want to be part of this next year, email me or email Kelly. Let us know that you want to be involved. And then, uh, we're looking for new artists that want to present to demonstrate and things like that as well. So I have the honor of presenting our morning, our first lecturer today, and her name is Megumi Naito, and she's from Tokyo, Japan, and received her MFA from Mass College of Art, and uh, she is currently the associate professor at is it early? Emmanuel, College. Emmanuel College, and um, and so I'll let her talk about her work, and this is Megumi Naito. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> Yesterday I was here. Um, Brian Gills gave the uh, fantastic lecture. I don't know if you were here for that. Um, so in the beginning of the uh, lecture, he was describing, you know, he teaches at University of Oregon, and uh, you know the university set up this fab lab and introduced the fab lab years ago. So um, when that happened, Brian actually didn't know how to work with these machines. So he had to kind of lock himself into this lab. Uh, he had to learn everything. Um, but that kind of shaped his work that he produces today. And <clears throat> this is kind of interesting because I'm in a sort of opposite situation. I teach at a very small liberal art college, and we don't even have a ceramics major. So our studio is kind of basic, um, and we have a limited resources. So I have to kind of employ this um, low budget uh, DIY kind of approach to this. Um, so my talk is really about that. Um, so the title of my uh, presentation is My Exploration of Paper Cura to Delta Printer. And a Paper Cura is the uh, software that I use and anybody can download it and it's free to use. Um, so I'll be talking about this software and then also Delta Printer. I think you will see one right there. Um, um, you probably know that you can put together Delta printer you know, quite easily uh, with you know, not much of money. So I'll be talking about this process through my three uh, studio projects. It's called Orimeware, Shareware, and Clubware. So before I go a little bit, not too far, um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about myself so it might make sense. Um, I always been interested in this combination or relationship between this uh, basic material clay and also digital technology. Um, do I like technology by itself? Not really. Um, I'm kind of an average person when it comes to you know using a technology or living with technology. I'm, I'm quite average on that. Um, but something to do with this kind of yin and yang, something opposite comes together, that's something that I really like. You know, I have a dog who is a mutt. You know, mutt is great. Um, I like fusion food. I cook Western food with, you know, Asian flavor. So something that opposite comes together, that's something that excites me. Um, so this idea kind of runs through my work, so that client technology always has been, uh, runs through in my work. 
So I used to do something like this um, since late 1990s. I have been you know, working with Photoshop and the images. Um, so I was printing, silk screening uh, these uh, pixelated portrait uh, onto clay. So these were, um, it's not done by decal, so you actually have to use a Photoshop to separate different colors in cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, and then physically making silk screen and then physically printing by hands. So this is in uh, 2000, 2009. So this is back in seven years ago when I made a switch between uh, from the uh, 2D digital imaging to uh, more like 3D modeling. So this is me, uh, 2010, my first time downloading Google SketchUp, which is a free you know, 3D modeling software. Um, back then, you know, MakerBot was still open source. Uh, they was, you know, just started to sell their first generation of uh, replicator. But then my big question was this, how do you physicalize the digital 3D models into clay uh, if you don't have an access to uh, 3D printers or CNA, C, you know, milling machine, how do I do that? So I have all this, you know, digitally modeled um, uh, models, but then I didn't know how to physicalize it. So in a search of this, I came across this. Uh, these are actually quite impressive costume that it's like life size that you you know you will wear um, and then I realized these are obviously came from digital models so I thought well you know if I can translate my digital models into paper then I can figure out how to translate the paper into clay so I started to uh, figure out you know what everybody's using so then uh, I came across this. Everybody was using a thing called Pepokura. Uh, it's a Japanese software. Um, it's their way of abbreviating paper craft. Um, so that's the name of this. And then uh, it does kind of look like, you know, something that kids and, you know, parents would do, and like maybe downloading a turtle and creating a paper turtle or something. But as you can see on your uh, right, you can actually do quite complex, you know, form with this. So I thought, wow, this is, you know, fantastic. I want to play around with this. Um, so then I started to, you know, uh, go through this process. Um, you know, I started to create all this quite simple, as you can see, simple uh, forms and turn that into clay. Um, so I started to call this Orimeware. And um, Orimeware is play on words between Oribeware and Origami. And uh, many of you guys probably know what Oribeware is. Uh, it's a Japanese teaware or tableware from 17th century. It uh, has, um, often has, you know, this bold, you know, geometric design. And then also Origami because, you know, I use the uh, paper folding technique. So together, Orime actually means like when you make that, you know, creases on a paper, that's, you know, that's orime. So I started to call this orimeware. So what's the actual process of Pepakura? So when I do a sculpture version of this, I, you know, start downloading uh, a pre-made um, digital model. So in this case, I search for mushroom. This uh, Super Mario mushroom came up and that's something that I use in this case. And um, then what I would do is I, I'm using Blender in this picture, but you can use any other software, Rhino, um, to, to do uh, reducing polygon of the uh, mesh object. So as you can see from the uh, left to right, uh, you can see how I am reducing the polygon of this mesh object. Um, I do it for two reasons. One is, um, to make the paper crafting process a little bit easier. So, you know, the form is a little bit simpler. And then also polygon is like a pixel for 2D images. So, um, you know, making it visible, I, I am kind of, you know, using a polygon as a symbol of digital, you know, form. So this is the actual uh, environment of Pepakura. 
So you would import your file. Um, Pipogrew doesn't let you import STL, so you probably have to do object file or something like that. And then uh, what you see is the, uh, uh, you know, your model over here on your right left-hand side. And then uh, what you do is simply just click the button and says unfold. And what does unfold do is that to make this three-dimensional model into a flat paper pattern, okay? And this pattern, usually when you unfold it, it comes in this one big connected, you know, uh, big thing. And then what you need to do is, here I have done, I set up my paper size and then break them into uh, your paper size so that you can actually print them. So what's really great about this paper Kura is this editing feature. So you have this large, you know, a pattern, but you can break it into any size of the paper that you want. And then also a great thing is to change the size really easy. So if you wanted to make a smaller scale model or make it, you know, a little bit bigger, it's quite easy for you to do that. Um, bad thing is that, um, might not be a bad thing for uh, some people, but it only runs on PC. And um, I mean, I use Mac, so I have to use the uh, boot camp, and then I have to load the uh, you know, Windows to operate this you know, uh, software. OK. And then also, um, it is free for you to use. You can do all this. You can import your file. You can uh, create this pattern, uh, set up your paper size, and print it. But if you wanted to save your file, then you do have to pay your license fee which comes in handy, and I will talk about that later. So this is the actual paper um, when you print out your patterns. I can show you the uh, detail of this. So it does come with the uh, instructional line, and I don't know if you're familiar with the origami. Um, origami instruction uh, lines kind of looks like this. So there's this dotted line, and then also line and dot and line and dot. So that would give you a clue to how, how, how to fold it. So we call it mountain fold and also valley fold, uh, if you fold it up or down. Uh, so that line would give you an instruction for that. Um, the, uh, the number here, I mean, the edge number is really helpful. So you would know what edge is you know, attached to what edge. Uh, and also you have this flap, so this is where you put your glue and quite easy to do that. So then my next step is um, I, I wax them, so I cut it, and then I score the line where I need to fold them. Um, you can use a dual butter knife, it uh, works quite well. Um, the reason for waxing is that when I finish uh, making this paper model, then I will pour a liquid plaster in there, in the cavity. So in order for the uh, paper model to you know, be stay uh, uh, to the shape, I need to make it watertight. So that's the you know, reason for the waxing. So almost like you know, if, you, if you had the uh, wax cup, you know, paper cup, you know, holds your beverage. So it's the idea of that. What kind of wax do you use? Oh, uh, good question. It's, I'm using here a furniture polish wax that has a lavender smell, which is very nice. But you can go to Home Depot and just buy wood, you know, working wax. You know, that has quite stinky smell. But I like this one better for that reason. Um, this one here, I am um, putting things together now. So you can use adhesive. I really like rubber cement for this process. It works fantastically. I just heard that um, you can't buy it anymore. So um, if you have an access to this, if you have a store, you can go to it and have a gallon of this. I would just buy it now. Um, but this process, I'm using rubber cement and putting things together and then also taping the edge um, to reinforcing the uh, joint. Uh, this actually shows the, uh, something that I should not be doing, which is, I don't know if you can see this very small, loose piece in the middle. Uh, that's part of my paper model. Um, that small pieces should always get attached first because um, you will lose it. Well, you might not, but I lose it. I lose a lot of things. You know, even when I travel, I lose boarding pass. That's like one of my big thing. Uh, this time I did not lose it, but I lost the uh, shuttle bus tickets. So I'm a kind of person that loses a lot. 
Um, this is me working in my kitchen, so I lost this very small piece. And then days later, I have to kind of look for, you know, where is this, you know, piece. First place, I went to recycle, couldn't find it. I actually find it from the kitchen garbage. You know, sometimes it's savable, sometimes it's not. But here is the thing. I, I'm not really putting this slide say I'm kind of an idiot losing everything. But I'm saying that the license fee that you pay uh, to get your you know, paper career out you so that you can save your file comes in really handy because when you lose pieces, then you can you know, print, it, print it again, right? Um, if you don't save your file, then you're going to have to import your file, you're going to have to break your patterns again, and then you have to print it. But sometimes it's quite hard to find that one piece that you're missing. And um, edge number change, so that's also one of the reasons why it's really great to pay for the license. Um, so here it's me just almost completing the building the paper model. And then after that, I would apply shellacs, uh, a few layers of them uh, would really work. And this is because uh, this makes the uh, next steps uh, quite easy. So the next step is I will apply the uh, plaster bondage to this. Um, the reason for that is when you pour plaster in it, uh, plaster is quite heavy, so it would distort the shape of the paper, you know, paper model. Um, but when you do this, you do have to kind of, you know, you have to apply this plaster bondage into all the crevices, right? So you do have to apply some pressure to it. Um, so shellac will actually make it quite stiff enough so that you can apply some pressure to it. So this is uh, me getting ready to pour the actual plaster in it. And then uh, this is the most satisfying kind of fun part. When you're done with it, then you can kind of tear the plaster bandage and tear the, you know, the shell to reveal what's inside. So that's how it looks. Um, because of the wax surface, it comes out quite smooth. Um, I don't usually have to do much of a sanding at all. So then if you know how to make the uh, you know, plaster mold or from plaster, then that's what you do. So you can make the uh, press mold or you can make the uh, casting mold. And um, I, I do casting, so this is me trying to make the, uh, my casting mold. And then that's the uh, completion of the mold. And then this is the uh, end result for that. Uh, so that's the, the uh, toad, you know, do you know the toad from Super Mario? So that's the piece that um, was in the slides. So this is currently on view at Third Room Gallery, if you're interested in seeing this. Uh, it's called Basket of Mushroom. And then I want to talk about the content of this work just a little bit. So when I started to uh, work in still life in clay, um, I looked at historical and contemporary works uh, regarding to this. And, um, <clears throat> The, uh, some of the artists that uh, influenced a lot, one of them was the uh, Spanish uh, painter Cotan. I don't know if you have seen this painting. Uh, this is an iconic you know, painting of uh, his work. Um, <clears throat> so one of the aspects that I really want to embrace in a still life work is that the way that the still life painting kind of tells a story about this artist or the environment that they lived in. And uh, I quite like his choice in object, which is quite simple, only produce. He only painted produce. And then also the uh, you know, composition is quite simple, but also powerful. And you might say this is spiritual too, which is interesting because Kotan actually uh, entered the monastery in 1603, just one year after he painted this uh, piece. And then nine years later, he became a monk. So it kind of tells, you know, uh, story about himself. And then another interesting thing that I found out was the, uh, the cut melon in the middle. Um, he actually cast this in a plaster because his painting takes a while to paint, so he had to preserve this form. So he, you know, made a cast of this melon and that's how he painted this, you know, painting. So I started to kind of, you know, develop a similarity <laughs> Uh, relationship between my method and his method. And so he's one of the person that influenced me a lot. 
Um, contrasting to this is William Kalf. Um, he is the uh, Dutch still life painter. Um, some of these objects shows the evidence of trade and commerce. Um, and then also they symbolize wealth. Um, he actually come from a wealthy family and he became uh, art dealer and appraiser later on in his life. So I thought this was also interesting because it shows, shows who he is. This is a little bit different. Uh, this is a British artist named Matt Collishow. Um, this is an uh, actual reproduction. It's a, a reproduction of an actual meal of the death row inmate in Texas. Um, it's slightly different because he's not really depicting his environment, but he is depicting somebody else's. Um, this is, uh, it's called A Time and a Place, a uh, collection of uh, objects that artist owns, but he, he, he uses this when he travels. Um, so these are common objects, you know, by itself, but putting it together in a way that it tells a story about who this person is. Um, I want you to pay attention to the middle uh, dark bottle on the back. It says gun oil. Do you think this is what I think it is? Gun oil? Nobody nodding? Do you, you don't think? G -U -N or G -U -N? Gun, yeah, like gun oil? What is this? <laughs> well, yeah. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I, I thought this was something to do with maybe to do with sexual activity, do you think? Maybe not. I don't know. I thought about looking it up, but I just didn't want it to get disappointed in case this is for athlete's feet. Or well, that won't be interesting. But if it's, you know, what I think it is, then oh boy, it could be kind of interesting. But anyway, so this is, you know, his collection of his own object. Um, this is uh, Cezanne's dish of peaches. And this is my dish of peaches. And it consists of uh, fruit peach and also princess peaches head. Um, so this is my process. I, I, in, my, in my case, the environment that I want to show in is the uh, aspect of my pra uh, studio practice where I'm surrounded by digital objects that are made by others. Uh, so instead of you know physical object, I wanted to use the you know digital object. Um, this is quite unique to our environment in this age. And then um, so here I am doing a search for peach, and I'm quite overwhelmed with the uh, result because Princess Peach um, came out quite a lot more than the actual fruit peach. Um, by the way, this is called 3D Warehouse, and it's attached to uh, Google SketchUp. Um, so when you use the SketchUp and you make a model, digital model, when you save it, the, it will ask you, would you like to upload your you know, uh, file onto a 3D Warehouse? You can say yes or no. So we can share these objects. Um, so 3D digital model have a strong tie to gaming and also animation. And that's also kind of unique to the environment and I wanted to capture in my work. So um, this is the actual model that I downloaded. And this is the uh, detail of the uh, uh, dish of peaches. Uh, so you can see the uh, princess peaches head and also the fruit peach. Uh, these are all made with a paper cura process, except the uh, crown on her head and also the peach pit and the cavity of the peach is 3D printed. So this is called Dish of Peaches Red. Um, all these pieces, pieces are on the wall and uh, the wall piece, the wall pieces mimics the uh, uh, non-gravity environment that I, uh, you can see in the uh, digital modeling environment. Um, sometimes I do include the suggestion of X, Y, and Z axis um, by just using simple elastic in my work. I go back and forth between sculptural work and a functional work. Um, that's one of the uh, great things about the uh, digital model. 
Um, um, it's that uh, you can manipulate digital model quite easily. So you can turn your sculptural pieces into functional one, you can simplify it, you can change the size. So um, I, I do go back and forth. So this one, oh, that one is actually made that actual peach part of the uh, uh, dish of peaches. And this one was um, uh, Princess Peaches had been elongated and you know, father simplified. <clears throat> Oops. Oh, sorry. Um, this is called plate of banana. Now, obviously, I did a search for banana for this. And um, <clears throat> do you know this guy from uh, Adventure Time? <laughs> banana guy from Adventure. It's a TV show. So he popped up, and he became a part of my composition. So this is plate of banana green. And that's the detail. And what's on his head is the um, share icon. I don't know if you have iPhone or Android phone, but if you have an Android phone, that icon is to share your file or messages. Um, so I use this icons to just suggest where these models come from. Okay, so here is a problem with the slides, but um, speaking of the uh, shareware, uh, my next uh, project I want to talk about is the uh, um, shareware project. So I'm sorry it's not really showing up on the slides, but um, the cup that you see on the top, um, it's, the, uh, it's called strawberry cream, and these are made from downloaded uh, uh, file. So you can see one. So I got the uh, I, IKEA cupcake here, and then the other file that I have was a strawberry uh, file that I downloaded. And then also I used the uh, Blender as a software um, to edit the, these two files to create the cup form. Uh, Blender is open source uh, software. And then also use the uh, Delta printer, as you can see on the, on the table. I will use the same printer to print these cups. Um, so these are really um, to celebrate shared online resources in an open source environment, which really changed my studio practice quite a bit. Um, so what I would do after this is um, I would share these cups with the public. Um, so I would scatter these cups in, into the city, and um, whoever is interested can pick it up. I have a QR code, so you can scan it, go to my website, and find out you know, uh, what this whole project is about. Um, you have an option to let me know the rough location of, uh, of the cup, and then I try to keep um, record of this. And the last, last project I want to briefly touch on is the uh, <clears throat> Collaborware. So this one really started maybe like a year ago as a fundraising um, uh, purpose. Um, so this cup is made with that same paper career method. And then I have my students get involved uh, supplying me some images of their prints or paintings. Uh, so I try to promote their work, and together we collaborated to create these uh, unique cup. Um, so the, these are sold at the uh, you know cup sale. Try to raise some funding for art students. Um, so I had one ceramic student who doesn't do painting nor drawing, and said, "Oh, Megumi, let's do a collaboration on form itself." So I said, "Okay." Uh, this was about last April. So I'm usually out of town during the uh, summertime. So I said, well, OK, when we come back in fall, we can get started. But then I thought, well, wait a minute. Maybe we can do this during the summertime, so even though I am away, um, with just a you know, simple share, you know, sharing file, we could actually produce something. So my students know this entire pro process of paper cura. Um, so he knows how to use you know, 3D printer. So we thought, OK, let's do this little experiment of distant collaboration. Um, so only way of communication we had was Messenger and then also just uh, you know, Google shared 
folder. Um, so we send each other a file, edit each other's, you know, uh, a, a file. And then uh, my student actually produce all the molds. Um, so in this case, you can see it on the left-hand side. Um, I did a paper cura process for the right, and he did the hand process for the uh, left. But all the production was done by my student. I only sent him a file. Um, so this is the end result of, of that. Um, so you can see the half and half kind of put together uh, into one cup. Um, so then uh, this kind of created this opportunity. I thought this kind of way of collaboration, distant collaboration was interesting. So now uh, we are scheduled to do this again during uh, this summer. So this is a question I am uh, thinking about right now um, because when we did this, we can actually you know, produce uh, what we planned with a high level of accuracy uh, without that much of a mistake. So um, what comes next is um, what I'm really interested in. Um, so in this opportunity of you know, distance collaboration, so you'd be able to collaborate someone maybe out of state or out of country or even somewhere you know, from the uh, other side of the planet. So this is something that I'm kind of thinking about where, that's, where this you know, process would go um, would be kind of interesting to think about. So if you have any good collaboration idea, please let me know. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. So I don't know if you have any questions, just let me know. Could you put your website back up, please? Yep. Um, would you be able to put the website back up onto the screen? Thank you.